I have the pleasure to present to you Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Yeah. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood? I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream. My four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama with its vicious racism, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification. Yeah. One day right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. And every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is the faith that I go back to the south with. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day, this will be the day with all of God's 
children be able to sing with new meaning my country tears of thee. Sweet land of liberty of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. And so let freedom ring. From the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire, let freedom ring. From the mighty mountains of New York, let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi, from every mountainside. Let freedom ring and we get capital. When we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. But we have lost the way. Greed has poisoned men's souls, has barricaded the world with hate as goose stepped us into misery and bloodshed. We have developed speed, but we have shut ourselves in. Machinery that gives abundance has left us in want. Our knowledge has made us cynical, our cleverness hard and unkind. We think too much and feel too little. More than machinery, we need humanity. More than cleverness, we need kindness and gentleness. Without these qualities, life will be violent, and all will be lost. The aeroplane and the radio have brought us closer together. The very nature of these inventions cries out for the goodness in men, cries out for universal brotherhood, for the unity of us all. Even now, my voice is reaching millions throughout the world, millions of despairing men, women, and little children, victims of a system that makes men torture and imprison innocent people. To those who can hear me, I say, do not despair. The misery that is now upon us is but the passing of greed, the bitterness of men who fear the way of human progress. The hate of men will pass, and dictators die, and the power they took from the people will return to the people, and so long as men die, liberty will never perish. Soldiers, don't give yourselves to brutes. Men who despise you, enslave you, who regiment your lives, tell you what to do, what to think, and what to feel, who drill you, diet you, treat you like cattle, use you as cannon fodder, don't give yourselves to these unnatural men, machine men, with machine minds and machine hearts. You are not machines, you are not cattle, you are men. You have the love of humanity in your hearts. You don't hate, only the unloved hate, the unloved and the unnatural. Soldiers, don't fight for slavery, fight for liberty. In the 17th chapter of St. Luke it is written, the kingdom of God is within man, not one man nor a group of men, but in all men, in you. You, the people, have the power. The power to create machines, the power to create happiness. You, the people, have the power to make this life free and beautiful, to make this life a wonderful adventure. Then in the name of democracy, let us use that power. Let us all unite. Let us fight for a new world, a decent world that will give men a chance to work, that will give youth a future and old age a security. By the promise of these things, brutes have risen to power, but they lie, they do not fulfill that promise, they never will. Dictators free themselves, but they enslave the people. Now let us fight to fulfill that promise. Let us fight to free the world, to do away with national barriers, to do away with greed, with hate and intolerance. Let us fight for a world of reason. A world where science and progress will lead to all men's happiness. Soldiers, in the name of democracy, let us all unite! <laughs> it has the power to inspire. It has the power to unite people in a way 
that little s does. It speaks to youth in a language they understand. Sport can create hope where once there was only despair. It is more powerful than governments in breaking down racial barriers. It laughs in the face of all types of discrimination. The heroes are standing with me are examples of this power. They are valiant, not only in the playing field, but also in the community, both local and international. They are champions, and they deserve the world's recognition. Together, they represent an active, vigorous Hall of Fame. A Hall of Fame that goes out into the world, spreading hope, inspiration, and hope. Their legacy will be an international community where the rules of the game are the same for everyone and behavior is guided by fair play and good sportsmanship. I ask you now to rise and join me in commending the, old, old, the original inductees into the World Sports Academy Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame. Barack Obama in 2004 was totally unknown. People were saying, huh, I don't know who this guy is. I wonder why they picked him. He had this reputation as a bit of an upstart, as sort of a young, rising figure in the party, but no one knew who this guy was. This was his chance to introduce himself to people. Tonight is a particular honor for me because, let's face it, my presence on this stage is pretty unlikely. My father was a foreign student born and raised in a small village in Kenya. What makes a great political speech is if you can somehow fold your story into this larger American story. The next thing he says is about his mother's family. His grandfather fought in World War II. He used the GI Bill. They settled in Kansas. So white people could say, uh, oh, uh, he's just like us. My parents shared not only an improbable love, they shared an abiding faith in the possibilities of this nation. I stand here knowing that my story is part of the larger American story, that I owe a debt to all of those who came before me, and that in no other country on earth is my story even possible. Going into this speech, we've had uh, four years of George Bush, and we felt as a country like we've grown further apart. 04 was very much a divisive partisan race. Obama's speech is an, in some ways an antidote to that. Alongside our famous individualism, there's another ingredient in the American saga, a belief that we're all connected as one people. If there is a child on the south side of Chicago who can't read, that matters to me even if it's not my child. If there's a senior citizen somewhere who can't pay for their prescription drugs and having to choose between medicine and the rent, that makes my life poorer even if it's not my grandparent. It is that fundamental belief I am my brother's keeper. I am my sister's keeper that makes this country work. E pluribus unum. Out of many, one. He gives a speech that presages his entire political message of 2008, which is this sort of post-partisan argument. Now, even as we speak, there are those who are preparing to divide us. The spin masters, the negative ad peddlers, who embrace the politics of anything goes. Well. 
I say to them tonight, there is not a liberal America and a conservative America. There is the United States of America. Obama was born with two great gifts. That one is his mind, and the other is his ability to speak to large groups of people. There are three things that Obama does that really makes that speech effective. He wants concrete detail. He likes story, and he loves antithesis, the use of repetition and structure to show contrast. There is not a liberal America or a conservative America. There is one America. There is not a black America and a white America and Latino America and Asian America. There's the United States of America. The pundits like to slice and dice our country into red states and blue states, but I've got news for them too. We worship an awesome God in the blue states and we don't like federal agents poking around in our libraries in the red states. We coach Little League in the blue states and yes, we've got some gay friends in the red states. We are one people, all of us pledging allegiance to the Stars and Stripes, all of us defending the United States of America. The way he uses his hands, he actually points a lot and does a lot of this and a lot of this and a lot of that. In doing so, he gives off this sense of energy. I am new, I'm someone who is dynamic. And he doesn't do that so much anymore. He's a little more solemn and reserved when he gives speeches today. But I think it's more reflective of his office. In the end, in the end, that's what this election is about. Do we participate in a politics of cynicism or do we participate in a politics of hope? It's the hope of slaves sitting around a fire singing freedom songs. The hope of immigrants setting out for distant shores. The hope of a young naval lieutenant bravely patrolling the Mekong Delta. The hope of a mill worker's son who dares to defy the odds. The hope of a skinny kid with a funny name who believes that America has a place for him too. Hope, hope in the face of difficulty. Hope in the face of uncertainty. The audacity of hope. His appearance at that convention, which was the best speech of the convention, better than John Kerry's, was electrifying. And without it, he wouldn't be president. I think sincerity means a lot. There are people who, when they speak, they speak the truth as they see it. And they're, they're very effective doing that. I believe this country will reclaim its promise and out of this long political darkness, a brighter day will come. Thank you very much, everybody. God bless you. Time is short. What is your life? It's even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. If I told, if someone had told me when I was 20 years old that life was very short and would pass just like that, I wouldn't have believed it. And if I tell you that, you don't believe it either. I cannot get young people to understand how brief life is, how quickly it passes. It seems like yesterday I was in school. Every one of us here has been given the same amount of time in a day. 1,440 minutes a day, 168 hours per week. 70 years God allows us. And it's interesting to me with all of our medical science, we've never passed that magic mark. The average American male today lives 70 years and four months. The average female 73 years and six months. More people live to be 70, but the average age of an American is still 70 as taught in the scriptures. What a thing it is when you think that you have just one short life to spend and it'll soon be over. I'd write down my priorities in life and I'd get committed to certain priorities. Now is the accepted time. The things we ought to do, the classes we ought to take, the books we ought to read. Do it now. The family that needs you, spend more time now. Write that letter home now that you've been meaning to write. Money you ought to give, give now. Time for study, do it now. 
people you ought to witness to, do it now. Every time the clock ticks, it seems to say now, today, if you will hear his voice. There may not be a tomorrow for you and for me because there's a warning to time. Time is running out for all of us. Time is too short for indecision and vacillation. Do not halt between two opinions. Fools say that time is long. Every morning we have 86,400 seconds to spend and to invest. And each day the bank named time opens a new account for you and for me. It allows no balances and no overdrafts. If you fail to use the day's deposits, the loss is yours. The Bible says redeem the time because the days are evil. And the days in which we're living are very evil. If there was ever a time for the gospel that can transform the human heart, it's now. Jesus said, as long as it is day, we must do the work of him that sent us. The night is coming when no man can work. The night is going to come in your life. Yet there was a serenity about the work of the Lord Jesus. It's the quality of life, not the length. Jesus only had 33 years. And it ended on the cross. To the world, he was a failure at that moment. Yet at the end of his life, he said, I finished the work that thou gavest me to do. It doesn't matter whether you live another year or two years or five years. Will your work be finished? Is there a quality to it? Is there a dedication to it? Suppose all of our members tithe their time to witness for Christ as we tithe our income for the church. Fill your heart with the word of God. I've found that those who know the scriptures are the ones that have the power today. But we need men and women who walk with God. And if you do that, you too can finish the work that God gave you to do. And help us to realize the brevity and the urgency of time. And may we invest what little time we have in the kingdom of God.